Welcome to today's Virtual Digital Economy Seminar. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you back. Our moderator today will be Tobias Kretschmer at the University of Munich, and he will introduce our speaker in a moment. Um, so I'm here again to give you some of the organizational details. And um, so as always in our uh, meetings here, if you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please send these to everyone in the chat and uh, Tobias will uh, organize them and will interrupt the speaker at a convenient time. Uh, and then you can choose to either ask the question directly or uh, let Tobias ask it for you if you prefer. <clears throat> uh, we will also collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way, so don't hesitate at any point to send questions in the chat. Today's que uh, session will be recorded, uh, so if you ask a question yourself in the video, then you will appear in that recording. All right, very happy to hand over to Tobias. Wonderful, and uh, welcome everyone, and uh, welcome in particular to Rob Siemens. Um, who is an associate professor at NYU. And I believe we've known each other for quite some time. Um, it's a bit frustrating actually, because uh, uh, Rob, I think graduated a good deal after me. So I think uh, you, you graduated in 2008 or nine. Um, and uh, ever since you've sort of been on the, on the accelerating lane, which as you know, in Germany are fast. Um, <laughs> so, um, Rob has uh, spent his uh, academic career at uh, NYU so far after his uh, PhD at Haas in uh, Berkeley. Um, so basically went from assistant associate uh, professor. He has recently become director of the Center for the Future of Management, which is uh, awesome. And I'm sure that, uh, that that work that you're presenting today is also a part of, uh, a part of this. <laughs> Um, spent a year as uh, President Obama's, uh, or on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, um, uh, which you know shows the the practical relevance of uh, his work and his expertise. Um, so very uh, nice. I'm not going to bore you with all the fantastic publications. Um, so I think Rob's published anywhere that one might care to publish, which is uh, which is cool. And we're now. Looking forward to hearing about robots at work in China. I believe you brought some support of at least one of your co-authors, so Nanjia, I think I've just seen. Um, and uh, well, the floor is yours, Rob. Looking forward to your talk. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Tobias, thank you for that kind introduction. I appreciate it. You've really raised the bar and now I have to <laughs> uh, see what I can do to, to approach that bar that you've raised. Um, also, thank you, um, Hans and, and Christian for inviting me to, to present. I, I really appreciate it. I've been sort of like waiting eagerly to be invited to present at this seminar because I, I, I love this seminar. Um, yeah, so my co-authors are Chi Ren Liu from Guangzhou University and Nan Jia from University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business, and, and Nan is also um, in the audience. So we have uh, tentatively called this Robots at Work in China. The Robots at Work piece is a nod to um, a, a paper that I'll mention uh, in passing in a few moments. And then in China, because we're gonna be uh, focusing on robots in China. Um, let me preface this by saying, this is really early stage work. Um, uh, I forget if it was Hans or Christian asked me repeatedly for a paper. There, there, there's no paper. We came up with an abstract on the fly. Uh, I, I sent the slides over. You know, we, we, basically, we basically have slides. We have uh, some results. The, the results are also a work in progress. Um, and so all that being said, right? So, so Tobias, I, I'm lowering the bar now, okay? So, so all that being said, um, we are really eager to get feedback. We're eager to get your questions and suggestions about how to improve uh, what we're doing. Uh, so with that, let's let's get going. So um, just to motivate things a little bit, um, I've I've recently been really interested in um, the effect of AI, robots, and other types of new technologies on firms, workers, and sort of the the, the economy uh, writ large. Um, I think many of us are in part because of the the dramatic increase in uh, funding and progress. Uh, when it comes to AI and the dramatic increase in firms that are using robots um, around the world, as well as progress in terms of what robots can do. Now we know from, from history 
that automation, right? And so it could be automation from AI, it could be automation from robots, uh, which is what we're talking about today. But looking back over history, we know that automation tends to lead to productivity growth on average at a macro level. Um, we could look at prior episodes like steam engines, electrification, early IT, um, all of these have led to productivity growth. Now, what I find, what I find particularly interesting is when you uh, leave the macro view and sort of zoom down to what's happening at the firm level, is we see that you know, for firms that, that, that adopt these new technologies, they do ultimately experience growth. And we'll talk more about what that growth looks like in a little bit. Um, but what's interesting is that they don't experience it right away. Right, so Paul David has this, um, so Paul David is an economic historian at Stanford, um, and he has this uh, paper that, that I really like, where he looks at what happens um, to uh, manufacturing plants in, in sort, of, sort of in industrial uh, areas of the US that are switching from steam power to um, electricity power. And he makes an observation, which is that it, it can take five years or more before these plants see productivity growth um, after adopting these new technologies. And so why is that? And, and uh, his reason for this is that it takes time for firms to make the necessary investment in complementary assets. Okay, so we're gonna spend a lot, of, a lot of time today talking about complementary assets. And I'll show you some examples of uh, what those look like uh, in the context that, that I'm looking at uh, in a few slides. Um, but, but at a high level, you can think of these complementary assets as being um, new types of human capital, as well as new types of uh, physical capital. Um, and firms need to make these investments, sort of co-investments, if you will, alongside the new technology investment. Now, what's interesting is it's not just that they have to make those investments, but, and I just find this really interesting, ex ante, they don't know what those investments are. And this is why it takes time, right? If they knew what those other investments were that they had to make, then you wouldn't expect to see a time lag, okay? But the time lag is there because firms are putting in place this new technology and then sort of tinkering around with their existing manufacturing process to find the right new combination of this new technology with their existing technology that's gonna require some new expertise, but they don't necessarily know what that is ex ante and some additional uh, physical capital. But again, they don't know what that is ex ante. All of this experimentation takes time. Uh, so that, that, that's uh, Paul David's argument. Uh, we're gonna be talking a, a little bit about that today. Um, Eric Brindhalson, Daniel Rock and Chad Severson, they have a very nice paper that uh, formalizes this called the productivity J curve, right? And so, you know, so here, here's the, the, the sort of J curve. So imagine a firm, you're, you're looking at a firm's productivity and they make an investment in, in a new technology, then you see a dip in the productivity before you ultimately see this, this increase. And that's because the firm is going through a period of experimentation um, as they try to figure out what additional complementary investments need to be made in order to get the productivity boost. Okay, so that, that, that's a little bit of background. Let's now turn to robots. Um, there have been, <clears throat> uh, there's been sort of a recent spate of papers on robots over the past uh, five years or so. Um, the first two, and th this isn't a compre comprehensive uh, literature review, but, but I just wanna touch on a few of these. So the first two of these, Greats and Michaels, this, by the way, is their paper is called Robots at Work. That's sort of the nod that we have in our, in our title. This was really the first paper to look systematically at what the effect of robots on economies um, um, looks like more generally. And what they find is that robots increase labor productivity, right? So increase productivity um, and have sort of a noisy effect on employment. Asimoglu and Restrepo have a very famous paper uh, that was, again, ultimately sort of published in 2020, uh, predates that. Great and Michaels published in 2018, but predates that. The Asimoglu and Restrepo paper has a measure of robot exposure at the uh, industry year commuting zone in the US, and they find that higher levels of robot exposure is associated with decreases in manufacturing and employment. Okay, so again, it's sort of a, a more macro level. Again, we see this increase in productivity, and then maybe some uh, noisy or, or perhaps negative effects on employment. Over the past couple of years, there have been, uh, I'm sort of shifting to the second uh, large bullet point here. Here, let me use my sort of pointer here. Um, there have been a recent set of papers that start looking at what's happening at the firm level as firms are adopting robots. One is using data from Canada, one from France, one from Spain. Uh, there, may be, there may be additional ones now, but, but th these three I'm, I'm quite familiar with. 
Now, there's a pretty common finding that comes out of these three papers, right? So this is now looking at the firm level, what happens as a firm is adopting robots. Um, all three of these papers find an increase in, in productivity or some measure, if you will, of performance or output. And all three of them find an increase in employment. Now for the Asamoglu and Restrepo, Lalarge and Restrepo paper, this is sort of uh, presents them, I, I suppose, with like an interesting conundrum, right? Because the Asamoglu Restrepo paper from above shows this decrease in employment, um, you know, writ large. Uh, right at, at the industry level. So what's happening such that you see this increase in employment at the firm level? And, and so what they find is that um, firms that are not adopting robots, you see a decrease in employment there. And then so, and then that sort of outweighs the increase in employment uh, that's happening at firms that are adopting robots. Okay, um, so, so this is sort of what we know in terms of what's happening uh, um, at firms uh, in, in terms of um, how robot adoption is affecting um, output and employment. Uh, let me actually just pause for a moment. Um, I, I'm not going to be monitoring the, the chat. Tobias, I understand you are. I, I, any sort of pressing questions that folks want me to address or Toby that you in particular want me to address? No questions so far. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay, so so this, this is sort of what we know, okay? Now, th this is what we know about robots and how robots are affecting firms, right? And I'm just going to go back a slide. But recall, we, we do know that complementary investments in complementary assets are important or, or have been important historically. So how about robots? What, what's going on with robots? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, share with you some anecdotal evidence. This is an my anecdotes, OK? So they must be right. <laughs> uh, not drawn from um, what I've seen in China. I haven't yet toured any plants in China that are putting in place robots. So, so I'm going to show you what I see. Um, or, or at least what I've seen um, when I've looked at plants here in the US, these are sort of plants in, in the Midwest, mostly part of the auto sector that are putting in place robots. Okay, so I just wanna, I, I feel like the visual is gonna be helpful. I think it, it just gives you a sense. It helps to sort of um, give, put some meat on the bones, I guess, in, in terms of what we've been talking about over the prior five minutes or so. Okay, so this, this is a plant called Soundwitch. That's the name of the company outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, they are part of the auto supply chain. In particular, what they do is metal stamping, okay? So um, you've all been inside of a car. Turns out there's a lot of metal in a car. Some of the metal is stuff that you see on the outside of the car, um, but it turns out there's a lot of metal on the inside of the, of the car, right? If you were to open up the, the door itself, you'd see there's all sorts of metal that's in there for various purposes. Uh, sometimes the stamping that's done to shape the metal is with these really large machines. Sometimes it's with fairly small machines and, and that, that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can see my pointer. I'm sort of looking, I guess, uh, at Toby, he's nodding. So you can see my pointer. Um, at the end of this robot arm, okay, so this, this silver thing right here is a, or gray thing is a robot arm. At the end of the robot arm, you see the silver piece here. This is a little piece of metal that has just been stamped by this machine here. Okay, so let's let's sort of notice a few things that, that's going on here. So this firm has adopted some robots, right? They purchased these robots here and they've, they've added stuff to the robots. So there, there's some additional machinery up here, some equipment up here. They've put a very specific appendage at the end of the robotic arm that can hold this little metal piece. Um, I'm gonna shift now over to the picture that's, that's on, the, on the right hand side. Uh, do you see this little bit of silver right here? This is again, the metal that's at the end of that robotic arm. Okay, so it's sort of the same picture. It, it, we're sort of looking at the same process, but from a slightly different point of view. And what I want you to, to see here is to notice that there, there are these blue lights here. Okay, these are blue lights that are at the end of the robotic arm. They're helping the robotic arm properly fit this little silver piece into the stamper. You also have a camera here that's uh, uh, video, you know, basically videotaping. I guess that's not the right word. That's sort of, that maybe dates me, but uh, it's capturing the video of, uh, of what's happening here. Uh, later on, once that stamping has happened and the piece gets put down on the assembly line, there's another sensor that sort of captures when that piece goes by. You notice that all of, all of this other equipment is, is attached to some wires. You see the wires sort of snaking behind the machine. Where are these wires all going? come back over to the picture on the left, you see this gentleman right here. 
uh, standing behind a desk, you can see one computer. It turns out there's two or three computers that are sort of hidden by the robotic arm, right? So all of this data is being captured uh, by the equipment that's there and it's being sent to the to this computer. This man is, it turns out he's a newly hired employee at this plant. He sort of is very familiar with the output that's coming in from the uh, from the machines and he's sort of monitoring it. He can speed up stuff, slow down stuff, stop stuff if it turns out that like, it looks like uh, the way that the cuts were made as the metal was being stamped is, is incorrect, okay? Okay, so, so that, that's this little story about what's happening here. I wanna highlight two things. First is that this plant, as it was adopting these new robot arms, had to make an investment in human capital, right? They hired this new individual with, di with different skills uh, relative to the skill sets that were at the plant before. And they also had to make uh, purchases of additional equipment that's not sort of technically part of the robot, but, but without that additional equipment, the robot would, would basically be useless, okay? So th this is... Um, um, a, a sort of a manu like a like heavy duty manufacturing type setting, you see similar types of things um, in other settings where robots are being used. So this picture on the left is a picture that I took when I visited Jabel Systems in San Jose. This is um, uh, a, a little uh, setup that they have for um, uh, th this is sort of putting together circuit boards, if I recall correctly. And you don't just put again they didn't just purchase the robot from Epson. They also had to make investments in all this other equipment as well. Uh, this, this right here is just sort of a, a picture. It's, it's from a McKinsey report. Uh, they've got it set up so nicely with the lighting so you can really see what's going on, right? The, whatever the, this firm is that invested in this yellow robot also made a ton of investments in other types of equipment and probably also in terms of training up th this individual who is now operating or overseeing or sort of monitoring this machine, okay, right? So again, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, provide visuals to help you understand what it is that I'm talking about when I talk about the complementary investments that need to be made alongside the robot, okay? Okay, so with, with all of that as backdrop, here, here's the research questions that we're after. First, how does firm level adoption of robots affect labor and productivity in China? Okay, so th this is thinking about what we know already about how robots affect employment and, and productivity in OECD, in OECD countries. Let's, let's take a look at China. Do, do we see similar types of things? Uh, it's gonna turn out that the answer to that is yes. On average, we do. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna think about um, some of the interesting sources of heterogeneity in China. And for us, one of the really interesting uh, things to, to consider would be the fact that in China, there are so many state-owned enterprises and state-owned enterprises. So by, let me just get through this slide. I see that there, there, there's a hand, right? So state-owned enter enterprises really matter in China. It's an important lever for China's state uh, capitalism uh, system. And so, what, and, and so how about Chinese state-owned enterprises? Do we see similar types of effects there? It's gonna turn out, no, we don't, right? So state-owned enterprises don't experience the same productivity and employment boost as private firms do. Um, and, and then what we're gonna do, so we'll sort of, the, the, the first two bullet points, if you will, are relatively straightforward. And then what we're gonna do, third and fourth bullet point, is basically try to explore reasons why this, this is the case. We're gonna look at why SOEs struggle to obtain the same productivity boost. Um, not right here, but later on, I'll sort of lay out, if you will, almost like a laundry list of reasons why they might not be getting the same productivity boost. Um, and perhaps no surprise, right, given uh, everything I've said so far, part of the reason that they're not getting the productivity boost is that they, for various reasons, are not able to make the same investments in human and physical capital as private firms do, right? So they are not making uh, the appropriate investments in complementary assets. And then we'll talk a little bit about why SOEs might be lagging in terms of investing in complementary investments. Okay, okay questions? Good. Um, Claudine had a question, uh, Claudine Gartenberg, uh, which I think is a great question, actually. So do you want to go Claudine. ahead and ask it? <laughs> so I, Claudine might need to be made a, maybe you have to unmute her, Toby? Yeah. Yep. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hey, Rob. Uh, Hi. So this is just, this could be just because I, I literally just listened to John Henry um, with my kids. But what, does it matter that we're talking about robots versus 
automation or just like machines in general? Like, how should I think about like, um, you know, dishwashers and vacuum cleaners? And this is just a basic, basic question for this entire literature, but what is it that's specific about robots versus other um, types of machines and automation that we should be thinking about here? Right, so, um, so, so great question. Um, I think this exact same question, I, I, as it, when I was a discussant for, at a recent conference, I sort of forced the presenters to try to answer. Um, so, so I'd say that there's sort of two things. So, um, I, or I put this question into two categories, right? So, um, category, so uh, bucket one is, we know from the, from the existing automation literature, right? Looking at like, um, uh, in, in, you know, um, uh, early IT, uh, electrification and steam, we know a fair bit from that. And so one question is, well, is there anything different now relative to what we know happened back then, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer to that question is, I don't know. There might be nothing that, that's different. And, and, and that's the honest answer that anybody would give you right now. Anybody who says, yes, it's totally different and, and I know why um, is, is lying <laughs> and is sort of trying to sell you something. We don't know. And so inductively we have to sort of explore this, okay? Um, so so that, that, that's sort of one piece. The second piece though is like, you're sort of talking about like washing machines, right? And, and, and so I guess, I guess really what's different there is, um, I mean, when it comes to many of these consumer goods, there's not any type of complementary investments that need to be made, right? We're, we're, right. So we're talking so about we're like- a bad example, because it's a consumer good. I was thinking more on the, like the things that replace it. Do, like, is there something special about like robotic arms versus like a bottler, like Coca-Cola's bottlers, you know, that do mechanical right. tasks that people used to do? Right. Yeah, <laughs> um, in, in principle, no. Um, I mean, we could be looking at any type of automation, and I think the same general story holds, right? Where you need to be making these investments in uh, complementary assets. Um, I, I don't think that robots, and I don't think that AI uh, is any different from steam. I don't think steam is any different from electricity. I don't think the story is any different there than it is from a bottler who's investing in automation. What I so what I think is. Um, a little bit unique about what we're doing in this setting, and, th and this will be inductive. I'm intentionally treating it inductively as opposed to trying to lead from theory, if you will, um, is trying to explain why some firm, right? So, so we know all this. We know that these complementary investments are important, and yet firms struggle with this, right? They, they sort of time after time have a hard time addressing this sort of complement, you know, investing in the complementary assets that they need to make. And in particular, we're gonna see these state-owned enterprises struggle with this. Um, and so why is this? Um, part of our story, where it looks like it's going, um, is that, you, you know, part of what you need is you need managers on the ground that observe what's being produced and have uh, incentives that sort of, uh, right, right, sort of high powered incentives that force them to make the investments that they're gonna need to, to match what, what's happening on the ground. And so if you will, this is gonna be a story that will suggest that, um, I, I guess if we wanna sort of like make it a little bit larger, it would be a story that argues in, that makes the following argument. AI and robots are never gonna replace humans because you will always need the humans to help understand what it is that need like the, these additional complementary investments that have to be made alongside AI and alongside robots. The AI and robots can't do that on their own. The AI and robots on their own do absolutely nothing. You need all of these other complementary investments in order to drive the productivity boost. How do you know what those other complementary investments are? You need managers that have high powered incentives um, and that understand the production process in order to make the right decisions about those other types of investments. Sorry, Claudia, I, I feel like I've sort of, uh, I, I've sort of um, gave quite a long-winded answer, but anyway, that, 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 that's the answer there. Uh, Toby, Thanks. was there another question? Uh, no, Richard was alerting me to Claudine's question. Okay. So, think you're safe. Okay, um, so what is it that we're gonna be doing here? Um, here's, here's what we're gonna do 
in terms of our methodological approach. Um, we're gonna build a large panel data set. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. We're gonna use that data set to show a link between robots and productivity and employment growth, just like those other sort of three papers that I touched on in, um, in, the, in the recent past have done. Um, let me say from the outset that there's, there's, no, you know, there's no randomization here, okay? There is, there is not a policy shock here either. There's a lot of selection and a lot of endogeneity as you would hope would be the case whenever a firm is making an investment in something really, really expensive, okay? So it is, it is not random. And thank, right? thankfully it's not. For, firms do not make random decisions when it comes to million dollar investments. That of course poses a problem to us. Um, right now I'm just gonna lay the problem out for you. You can later on follow up and send me emails about clever ideas to, to address this, but right now I'm just gonna lay it out. Then when we turn, in terms of the selection issues, then when we turn to um, sort of the core of what we're gonna do, which is look at the effect of robots on things like employment and things like that, we'll be working with panel data set with firm fixed effects and things like that. that that'll help us a little bit. Um, th there's more we could be doing with, with matching. Um, and again, you might have other clever ideas as well. Um, so we're gonna be looking at, the, at how robots affect productivity and employment. Um, and then importantly, one of the things we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at what happens at state-owned enterprises versus uh, private-owned firms. Again, not random. Uh, there, there might be many different reasons why differences arise across state-owned enterprises and non-state-owned enterprises. However, part of what we're trying to understand is why these differences arise. Um, and so that, that's something that we're gonna, we're gonna explore. We're gonna explore various sources of, of variation here to try to understand why these differences arise. Okay, so um, in terms of the data, so the, uh, the core data comes from something called the Annual Survey of Industrial Firms uh, that's put out by the National Bureau of Statistics in China. Um, for those of you that have worked with um, US Census Bureau data, for example, like the Annual uh, Survey of Manufacturers, it, it, it's that sort of equivalent type of data, um, but in China. Okay, not from the Census Bureau, but from the National Bureau of Statistics in China. Um, it has very good coverage of uh, the manufacturing sector in particular. Uh, the, there, there's some information there that you can see on that. Um, two other things to point out. We're gonna be looking at the years 2000 to 2013. We very intentionally stop it in 2013. That's when domestic production of robots in China really takes off. Um, and so we are gonna stop looking uh, but before that happens. Instead, we're focused on 2000 to 2013 um, because the way that we're gonna figure out which of these plants have robots is we're gonna work with a separate data set from China's General Administration of Customs that tells us which plants have imported robots from uh, places like Japan um, or, or, or other countries, okay? And so th th that's sort of how we're identifying which of these firms have robots. For the years 2004 and 2008, we have um, additional data about the types of employment um, at, at these firms. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we get to it. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is uh, validate that the robot data that we have looks pretty good. Okay, and so the way that we're gonna do it is we're gonna compare the robot data that we've collected with data from an organization called International Federation of Robots. Okay, IFR. So what IFR does is it collects, it, it, it's, it's basically a trade group and it collects uh, information from robot manufacturers around the world that are part of its uh, trade group. Um, and, it, and it sort of provides this data to researchers um, at, a, at an aggregated uh, level. Uh, so, so country year, in some cases, country industry year. And so in red is, this is the IFR data Okay, according to IFR, this is what robots look like in China. Okay, th this is data that come from its trade members. Um, what we're getting is we know exactly what was imported, right? And we are able to allocate it to firms. What we're doing right now is we're just aggregating it up to the year level. And what we have is in blue. So two things to point out here. First thing is that there is a level difference between the two. We would expect this because IFR, it's not that every robot manufacturer is part of IFR, so they're gonna be undercounting relative to what we can count. So we're not surprised by the level difference. It's, but what we 
uh, like is that the, uh, the, the, the trends look about the same. And so that suggests to us that we are, you know, more or less capturing um, uh, what, what we should be capturing. And again, we're going to stop in 2013 because in 2013, there's this huge increase in domestic production of robots. Okay. And then it makes it very difficult for us to see what's going on um, since we're just identifying who has robots based off of this import data. Um, oh, oh. Yeah, Toby. Um, on, on that graph, um, is there anything that happened sort of between 2008 and 2011 when things clearly took on a very different character? Yep. So you can see the drop in imports in 2009 and then the big boost in, you know, subsequent boost in 2010. So, um, two, so, so, so that, that's one thing that's going on. There, there's the financial crisis. Um, the second thing, though, is that just in general, if you look, I, I don't want to go all the way back up, but if you if you recall the earlier uh, figure that I had, let me let me do it. It's it's Toby asking me, so let me let me do it. So this is worldwide um, uh, worldwide shipment of robots. Okay, a hundred thousand per year. It was at about a hundred thousand, and and if we were to extend back in time, we'd see that. You see that drop right at like halves in 2009, recovers, and then it's like basically after 2010, you see this increase, right? I mean, it, it triples in the years following, okay? Um, so we see that around the world, that there's that it's roughly starting in 2010 that we start to see a dramatic increase um, as robots are, as people are sort of understanding uh, more and more about how to work with robots in a manufacturing setting, these sort of more advanced uh, modern day robots. And so part of what's going on here is that in China, the story is no different than it is in the rest of the world. It's starting in 2010, where you start to see this dramatic increase. So it is, it is I guess, useful to point out, though, that what you're, you're helping me point out is that, you know, a lot of our identification is going to come, especially when we work just with like 2008 and 2004, is going to come off of sort of the subtle changes early on um, in, um, in, in the decade in, in China. Okay, but do, do, you, do you have any intuition? I mean, you said that so people slowly started figuring out what robots are good for, but this this seems like a sea change. I mean, it's a quadrupling of yeah. of, uh, of of diffusion in a quick time. I mean, Luis has written papers on catastrophes in diffusion, and that looks very much like a, a almost a textbook example. Um. I will, I, and I saw Luis on here earlier. Luis, it's nice to see you uh, virtually, even though normally um, we'd be a few feet from each other. Um, so, so I'll, um, I, I'll have to follow up with Luis on on that. It, it, it is the case that there was a, um, and I don't remember the exact details on this, but th there was a bit of an effort to. Um, in China to, to put a lot of money in manufacturing and other sectors as a way to try to buffer uh, against the downside effects that happened in 2009. And so, so that could be part of what sort of at least pushed stuff up in 2010, but in terms of why it's still going up 2011, 12 and 13, um, I, I, I'm not sure. And there's two more, two more questions or one may be related to the other. Um, Hannes was asking if the plot looks the same for state-owned enterprises and privately-owned enterprises. Yeah, um, that, that, that's a great question. I don't have that here. We've looked at it and it looks pretty similar. I'll show you something a little bit related to that uh, later. It looks pretty similar, although um, it turns out there are, and this is maybe a good segue to this, um, you know, there are not many state-owned enterprises, right? About 5% of the firms or less than 5% are state-owned enterprises. Moreover, in general, there, there's very little investment in robots, right? For firms in our sample, right? Let, you know, 0.2%. Um, and so when we look at SOE investment, it is noisy. And so, um, and again, you'll see a little bit of evidence of this later. And so it, it, it'll look, it'll look sort of like this, but it'll look, It'll just look noisier, okay? But the but the the, the, the general trend would be similar. Okay. So and, you, and you said there was another question, Toby. Well, um, Vastav Ratras uh, wrote that I don't think the IFR lets you identify that. So maybe that was referring to Hannes's comment. 
Could you give me a quick sign, Bastav? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Go on, Rob. You're on okay. your way. Great. I, I I don't know if that. So that was not a question for me. That was you clarifying something. I mean, again, just to make sure it's totally clear. Like I, I could not use. I we couldn't do this chart here. Breaking it out by SOE and non SOE. IFR data just gives us aggregate at the country level. It does not break it down by type of firm, uh, region, th things like that. And so when I was talking about noisy, I was, talk I was sort of just zeroing in on, if you will, our blue line, um, which we, we can do whatever we, we want with because we have it at the firm level. Okay, um, summary stats. So two things to point out here first, very few firms are actually investing in robots during this time period. Um, second is about, you know, so four and a half percent of the firms are state-owned enterprises. Now, what's interesting, or, or one thing that's interesting is that there are different types of state-owned enterprises, right? Not all state-owned enterprises are the same. Um, it turns out that there, that you could have a state-owned enterprise that is um, um, sort of an instrument of, of the central government. Okay, so we're going to call this SOE central only. It could be uh, an instrument of the provincial government, or it could be an instrument at, at the local level, okay? Um, so imagine those three buckets. It turns out there are many more buckets than that, but imagine those three buckets. Um, it's a source of variation that we're gonna take advantage of. And just to preface things a little bit, um, you might imagine that the more local something gets, then the closer you get to the, the manager of a private owned firm, who is really incentivized to try to figure out what works at the local level, right? Who has a good understanding of what the labor conditions are, has a good understanding of what the, um, um, the product market is like versus, versus an SOE that is at the sort of higher level that might have less of an idea about what is needed uh, to be done at the local level. Okay, so first, now this is sort of on the selection piece. The first is, um, uh, robot adoption. So here we're just looking at uh, all the firms in our in our sample, which firms adopt versus not, and what are the characteristics of the firms that adopt. Um, actually, let me just start right here at the top. So it turns out that it's the more productive firms that adopt. This is uh, lag productivity, um, and they tend to be bigger firms, right? So this is capital. They, they also are more likely to be exporters. Th uh, th this, by the way, sort of lines up um, more or less similarly to what we see in OECD countries in terms of the firms that are adopting robots. Okay, Pr pretty similar story here. Um, now it turns out that SOEs are less likely to adopt and it doesn't, and, and that story is pretty much the same regardless of the level of SOE that you look at. Okay, so, so as I alluded to earlier, we have some selection issues going on. Okay, we're just, for right now, we're, we're noting it. And, and, and acknowledging it. Um, I'm about to show you a, um, a series of, of tables where we're gonna look at various outcomes that are at the firm and year level. They'll have firm and year fixed effects. We'll have a, <clears throat> a dummy for robot adoption there. And just I just wanna be clear about this, how this works. So uh, when we observe a firm adopt a robot, Right, and by adopt it means they've imported a robot. Um, that that dummy will turn on for that firm in that year, and then it stays on for the rest of the panel. Okay. Um, if and then and then we'll have an interaction between that robot dummy and um, a state-owned enterprise. Right, whether the firm is a state-owned enterprise, we we have a bunch of controls that I'll, I'll sort of skip. Um, we'll be clustering stuff at the firm level. Rob, um, two, two questions I think yep. are uh, coming up. One by Dario Pozzoli, um, more of a, a data question. You want to ask it yourself, Dario, or? I'll just go for it. Um, so uh, Dario asks, what happens if a domestic firm purchases a robot from a local retailer yep. instead of importing directly from abroad? Sounds like you've heard this before. <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's see, I don't have anything on that here. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let me come back, let me, so we can, um, so, so basically, so, so first of all, um, anybody that's, um, so there are, are firms that do that, right? So th these would be like robot importers that then resell them. So let's call them robot resellers. Um, 
the robot resellers are not going to be in our sample, right? So, so there's a couple of points on it. I just want to assure you that when we look at productivity effects and things like that, we're, th those robot resellers are not in here, okay? Now, what is it um, that the robot resellers are doing? So they're importing robots and then reselling them. So in principle, what we're going to be doing is we're comparing firms that we know imported a robot to firms that I mean, we're going to fix effects in there. So essentially, you're going to compare that to the firm before it imported the robot. Okay. But you could also imagine that what you're doing is comparing those firms that adopted a robot to firms that didn't adopt a robot. Now, because there is the presence of these resellers, we know that some of those firms that to us look like they didn't adopt robots actually did. Okay. And so, if anything, what might be happening is that could be pulling down the difference between the adopters and, and, and the non adopters. Unfortunately, that, that's sort of all we can say about it. We, we don't know the, the um, there are resellers. Um, th they're not accounting for the for most of what's going on here. I should, in general, provide info for you on that. I don't have that here, but we've looked at it. Um, but we don't know where those robots are then being resold to. Okay, great and question. Then, and then we've got Neil who's raised his hand. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rob. So super interesting. So I was just wondering about your um, specification there where you're using a dummy for the robots. And I guess yeah. when you were talking about that, um, that you have the import data, I was hoping you might be using like a, a count or yep. like something like that. And I was just wondering, because I mean, so this is something I encounter in my work all the time, right? Where you're saying someone is using a computer and you're like, well, in a, you know, in a company like IBM, yep. one person using something different might be small. So can you give us some sense of the, the scale? Yeah. Within yeah, yeah. So we are, yes. So everything I'm going to show you is just looking at the dummy for adoption. Um, we, we do have the value and I don't know that we necessarily have the count, but we do have the dollar value that was spent. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything that I'm going to show you holds up if we look at the dollar value, but I, I just, I don't have that that I'm going to show you. But, but can you give it like some sense of, if we think about like the total capital that the firm is deploying, right? Are these robots, I mean, is this a big investment for them in terms of the, the scale of their capital? Or is this kind of a, you know, uh, on the margins one in some part, some smaller part of the business, for example? Um, it's a it's a great question. Um, no, off the top of my head, I can't give you a sense of that dollar value. Um, there is a little bit more that I'll say on dollar value, though, in a few slides. Great. Um, I mean, I can tell you anecdotally in the U.S. just to give you a sense of this, right? If it's useful, um, an investment in a robot arm in a manufacturing setting might be like between twenty five to seventy five or twenty five to fifty k, let's say, for the arm. And then anywhere from 25 to 500k of additional investment in all that other equipment, right? So that so those that, the, the complementary investments, and, and I'm glad that you're raising this, Neil, you because know, it's an important point that I should be making earlier, right? These complementary investments are non-trivial, which is part of the reason why it takes it's not right. And so that I just want to sort of use this as a moment to sort of come back to what we were saying at the start. Um, why does it take time for firms to see these, or why is it so hard in some cases for firms to, to see these product, the productivity boost? It's not just because it's expensive, it's because you don't know what it is that you have to invest in and it's expensive, right? If it was cheap, <clears throat> then it would be um, you know, not a big deal to sort of do a bunch of experimentation amongst all the different configurations you could do, but it's actually quite expensive. And so this is why firms are sort of careful with thinking through uh, what these complementary investments are that they need to be making. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Um, oh, so, so, okay. So here's the first result here. Uh, firms that are adopting robots see an increase in productivity, right? So about a 3% increase in productivity. This, by the way, like lines up pretty well with uh, what we see for OECD countries. Right. I, I'll, I'll, when I refer to OECD countries, what I mean are the papers that are coming out of, uh, that are sort of using similar techniques to see what happens at firms that are adopting robots in Canada, France, and, and, and Spain. Right. So we see this little productivity boost. What's interesting, though, is you, you, you don't really see the boost for the SOEs. Same story with labor. You see an increase in labor, right, an increase in employment, but not so much 
for the SOEs. Okay, so just summarizing what we just saw a moment ago. So robot adoption is associated with more productivity and employment in China on average, just, just like what we see in OECD countries. However, the SOEs do not experience the same productivity and employment boost as non-SOEs. As Sometimes I'll say non-SOEs, sometimes I'll see, say POEs, this is private owned enterprises. So I also wanna pause for a sec. Notice how careful I was. Toby, you, you see this, I say robots are associated with more productivity and employment in China. I was very careful not to say robots cause a productivity boost or an increase in employment. Is, is that good? It's great. I would not reject your paper. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's only so much rejection one can take. Okay, so so th this is okay. So so to this point, we basically are showing that, and from my point of view, it's not really much of a surprise, right? We're basically showing that um, the same story that we see in OECD countries, the research that's been done in OECD countries in terms of how adoption of robots affects what's happening in firms. In general, that same story holds up in China. What's interesting though, is that not at these state-owned enterprises. And so what are reasons why, why this is? So here's sort of the start of the laundry list. Maybe they're underinvesting in human capital. Maybe they're underinvesting in physical capital, right? So these first two are the, that, that's the complementary assets story that we've been talking about. But there could be other reasons that are sort of a little bit more China specific. Um, so maybe what happens is that these state-owned enterprises are part of the sort of, you know, that the, the China is playing a longer game here, and they don't care if any given state-owned enterprise um, gets a productivity boost or not. What they're hoping to do is learn, um, right, they're sort of using the SOEs as guinea pigs, and from these SOEs, they're learning about what works and doesn't work, um, and then sort of using that information to sort of help other private firms, Okay or, and this is number four, maybe the officials that run the state-owned enterprises are just investing in the, in the robots for show, right? Because they want to sort of, um, you know, robots are the hot new thing. So they're investing in them, but, but not really using them, okay? Um, now, there might be other reasons as well, but what we're going to do is we're trying to come up with a laundry list of reasons for why SOEs might underperform. And then we're going to go to the data and we're going to sort of systematically uh, start going through these. Um, okay, so explanation one is human capital, okay? And we, we've sort of, this is, we, we've talked about this sort of investment in human capital, this, this investment in, in, in a, a type of complementary asset throughout the talk today. So hopefully that it's relatively clear why we think this might be important. Um, now for the years 2004 and 2008, we have more detail about the type of labor at the firm. We have information about the number of workers that have a college degree or higher. Um, the number of workers that are engineers or other technical workers, the number of workers that are certified. So this would be, for example, um, if you've been uh, in the U.S., if you've been sort of like re received some sort of OSHA certification or something like that, or if you're an accountant and you've gotten some professional certificate, right? So th th this is what we mean by certified labor. Um, and then we know um, the number of female and the number of male uh, workers at each plant. Again, j just for these two years. Oh, can I can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Um, there are two questions that are very similar, um, and I'm going to unmute Benson um, to ask the question. Right. Um, hi. Um, I was just wondering if um, the SOEs or different levels of SOEs are actually in similar industry as the POE. So, yeah. Yeah. So all of the so so this is a great question. Um, and and an, an important one, one we, um, so, so all of the results I just showed you included, um, I mean, they, they have firm fixed effects, but we were also, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up two papers in my head. Yeah, so, um, so they had firm fixed effects. So we've sort of taken care of um, industry differences that way. Um, we do know that in, in China, um, some industries are considered more strategically important than others. And so you might expect that SOEs are more important or play a different role in those industries than others. Um, so we haven't yet done, but we have thought about 
trying to think about like a, a useful way to categorize industries and then sort of look at the results on an industry by industry basis or right. industry clump or industry cluster by industry cluster basis. We haven't yet done that. Um, we, we could, you know, it, it's, it, it's straightforward to do. It's just a question of how far up to put that on the list of things we need to do. Um, Cause we're, while we think it's interesting we don't know that that totally helps us uh, disentangle some of what's going on. If you have ideas on that, though, please uh, shoot us an email. Thank you. Great. Toby, Thanks. was there another Bro. question? Um, similar flavor question. Eileen is happy. So. Okay. Okay. So human capital. So um, firms that are adopting um, robots, you see an increase in college educated workers, technical workers, females, you don't see the same for SOEs that are adopting robots, okay? Private-owned firms, you see it. SOEs, you don't, okay? Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tick through, I'm gonna sort of tick through this quote unquote laundry list and then we'll sort of come back and try to pull all this stuff together. Explanation two, capital investment, right? So recall you have to make uh, investment in these complementary uh, capital assets as well. Um, and so what do we see? The firms that are adopting robots, we, we do see that they make these complementary investments. Uh, SOEs, it's, it's not as sort of dramatic as, as some of the prior results, but again, you see the negative coefficients here instead of the positive coefficients. So looks like there is a little bit of trouble making investments in the additional capital that's needed. Okay. Again, I'll come back to all of these to sort of pull it together. I just want to, in the interest of time, sort of tick through uh, the results. Um, explanation three, and, and Neil, here we're coming to some um, information on the dollar value. So um, if, if it's the case that robots are bought either for show or for reverse engineering, then you might expect that the dollar value of the robots is going to be relatively low for SOEs. Right, if I'm adopting, so, so think, let me state that argument in a different way. If I'm, adopt, if I'm a private owned firm and I have say 10 production lines that I wanna bring robots into, then I'll perhaps be investing in you know, 10 robots, one for each production line. It, whereas if I'm an SOE with 10 production lines, but I'm just investing in show or because I want to reverse engineer, maybe I would just buy one robot from one of those production lines. I don't have to do it for all 10 if I'm just gonna be trying to reverse engineer. And so what we're gonna to try to do is compare the dollar value of SOE investments in robots to the dollar value of POE or, or you know, non-SOE investments in robots, okay? Now we can't just look at the, the dollar value. We can't just look at the dollar values. We also want to, you know, we have to do a little bit of normalization. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna normalize by firm output. Right, so revenues on an, you know, so annual revenues. We, we could have done it on employment. You know, there's different ways to, to normalize, but we wanna make sure that we're normalizing, right? If we knew how many production lines were, we could normalize by the number of production lines. We don't have that, right? But so we wanna normalize and then compare state-owned enterprise in robots, so sorry, state-owned enterprise investment in robots to private-owned firm investment in robots. And that's what we are charting out here. So we've done that for each firm. Uh, we've then averaged across all the firms of each type, state-owned enterprise and non-state-owned enterprise for each year. And that's what you're seeing here. So let's start with the orange line. So this is non-state-owned enterprise. Okay, and you see it, you know, sort of gradually trending up. State-owned enterprise. So if we, if, if we believe that they were investing just to reverse engineer it, then you'd expect that they would be below the orange line. And in some years they're below, in some years they're above. It's much noisier in part because there are many fewer state-owned enterprises. And so any one or two extra in a given year is perhaps gonna be uh, moving things around. But in general, it looks to us like that blue line more or less lies above or you know, on top of that orange line. Um, and so from our point of view, th this sort of works against the reverse engineering slash investing in robots for show hypothesis. Um, let's see, actually, let me just sort of, how are we doing for time? Let me jump here. I could come back to that in a moment, but let me jump here. 
Okay, so let, let me just sort of recap what it is that we're finding so far. So robots are associated with more productivity and employment in China on average. SOEs don't experience the same productivity and employment boost. Uh, why? Well, SOEs don't shift their mix of human capital. It doesn't, you know, there might be something going on with investment in physical capital as well, but that, that explanation is maybe weaker and it doesn't look like they're investing in robots for show or, or reverse engineering. So really it looks like it's a human capital issue that SOEs are having, right? So sort of one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point down, right? So it suggests that there are frictions at SOEs around hiring certain types of workers, letting go other types of workers, right? So in other words, at most firms, you expect like a sort of a churn in terms of the types of workers that you have employed in order to take advantage of, of robots. That churn that you expect that you see at private owned firms, we don't see that at state owned enterprises, right? And so as a result, they're left with the wrong type of workforce to take advantage of the new technology. So, so that, that's, that's, that's where we believe we are uh, to this point. Now, the question is, well, uh, well, why? Why is it that they struggle with this? And this comes back a little bit to Claudine's question at the, at the start, um, which is sort of around, well, what's different around these SOEs? Um, we think one of the, the big issues, and I, I, I tried to give a crisp answer to Claudine, and I realized that I didn't. I know that I didn't, Claudine. I, I apologize, um, in part because we're, we're still trying to work around making this crisper. But we think it has to do with you know, if you imagine a, a principal agent model, I, I'm not going to present a model for you, and, and I'm doing this on the fly, okay? But but sort of imagine a pr principal agent model um, where you have the state, -owned, where you have the the central government telling the state-owned enterprise what to do, but there's still a fair bit of stuff that is that needs to be left up to the discretion of the manager, right? So you can tell the state-owned enterprise to invest in robots, but you can't, right? You can ex ante specify that, but you can't ex ante specify all the other complementary investments that need to be made because you don't know what those are ex ante, right? And so in this type of principal agent model where you know, principal is the state agent is, is, is the local manager of a state owned enterprise, um, they aren't incentivized, the, the manager is not incentivized, um, right? It's not rewarded um, to go out and sort of figure out what those other complementary investments are. That's totally different for the private owned enterprise, or at least you might imagine, and, and uh, Nan and I are thinking that this might be an interesting additional area to explore. You might imagine that that's gonna be different at private owned enterprises, although there might be variation there depending on different types of government governance structures at uh, private owned enterprises, right? You could imagine um, owners that are very distant, let's say from the manager, okay? Um, let's see how we're doing for time, okay. Um, where we're trying to go with this is around developing a little bit of a theory around implications of political control for technology adoption and use. And Claudine, that we think is new, uh, but we are not we are not there yet. Um, provided we get there, then we, we think that we would be able to make a nice contribution to the literature on automation and firm production, as well as a contribution to the SOE literature. Um, looks like it's a, uh, I have a minute left. And so I'll end there just so I can say that I, I at least ended on time. And then if there's time for like a remaining question or two, I, I suppose I could take those. But, but more than happy, of course, to take your questions and feedback offline. Wonderful, Rob, thank you very much. Um, I think Neil has another question. Um, at least your hand is up. Okay, and I need, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I, I had two thoughts. So one, I wanna follow up on my earlier one. So um, it strikes me that because you know a, a bunch about these firms, you could say something along the lines of their, their investment in a robot in this particular year represents about 5% of their total investment in, in like capital or things like that in a particular year. And I think knowing that number might be very interesting because you're observing this productivity improvement, right? And so you could get some measure of like how much more productive is a robot for these firms than the average unit of capital that they're yeah. investing in. And I think that might be very interesting and, I, and relates to my second point, which is 
I wonder if you could split your sample and say, like you sort of, you, you motivated a bit at the beginning by like the Paul David work. And, and I think you could sort of say something like in the first part of your panel, you have a whole bunch of firms that are exploring, they're doing this sort of adaptation that you talked about. And then you might say like, estimate how, what their productivity improvement is in that period and see how predictive is it of them scaling up their number of robots in the yeah. second period and how many people just drop out and say, oh, actually we're, you know, we, we couldn't make all those complementary assets uh, investments work and therefore we're not gonna do this anymore. Yep. Yep, thanks Neil. Perfect, so I think we're, we're still pretty much on time. Um, thanks very much Rob, I think this was, uh, this was great. It, you know, your papers are a lot better than your taste in pretzels. I will have to say. Um, but let's not. Don't, don't get me started on beer and air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, there were two more raised hands, but I think we're uh, we're sort of out of time. And Chris wants to make a, an announcement for the next uh, for the next Vite seminar. But uh, let me all uh, let let's all uh, thank Rob and giving the seminar, I thought it was really interesting and I uh, look forward to seeing the paper evolve. Yep, thank, thank you all for, for listening in. Thank you all for the comments. And again, please, please, please shoot us emails with additional comments and feedback. Thanks also from my side. I just wanna make a quick announcement before we close. The white seminar continues in two weeks and our next and unfortunately last talk of the semester will be on June 3rd. Look forward to having Diane Coyle from University of Cambridge. So thanks again, everybody, uh, for coming, for the lively discussion, and uh, looking forward to seeing you on June 3rd. Bye, everyone.